Hello everyone. Today in this video, uh, I will go over how to solve a, a passage problem on the MCAT. Before we move further, I just want to mention that um, forgive me for uh, the shadow of the picture that I took uh, from a book, right? To solve the problem here and put it on my iPad. And two, uh, was that I actually have linked a video down below where I do talk about the general strategies to uh, solve a passage problem on MCAT and uh, especially the organic chemistry problems. And I obviously will use some of those strategies over here, but I have detailed down below a, a separate video where I do go over um, some of the common practices strategies or what are the common um, recurrences that we see in um, a organic chemistry passage problem, okay? So the first thing, first off, I do mention in that video is that we don't have to read and understand the whole passage if it's specifically organic chemistry passage, right? There is not much to learn from that passage but what we want to pay very, very close attention to is uh, these structures, these figures, okay? And whatever is going on in the figures, we have to pay close attention to. If there's any NMR data, IR data, that's very, very important as well. And then, well, then we see these structures in the figure too. That's also important, right? And we can just skim over the text. We don't really have to understand everything. So based on this passage, mentioned here, we'll solve some of the problems over here, okay? So the first step, skim, skim over the passage really quick, so let's do that together. In a in mammalian systems, aromatic hydrocarbons are enzymatically metabolized by P450 into aerine oxide. When ingested and inhaled or inhaled, aerine oxides are compounds in which one of the double bonds of an aromatic ring has been converted to an epoxide. These molecules can rearrange to form phenols, which are harmlessly excreted. As shown in the figure one, aerine oxide rearrangement requires the formation of an intermediate carbyl cation and subsequent hydride ship. Benzopyrene found in tobacco smoke automobile exhaust is one of the most troublesome natural aerine oxide because it is a procarcinogen due to the bioconversion of a number of harmful molecules such as 7-8-diol epoxide shown in figure two. The danger of 7-8 uh, epoxide lies in the unwillingness of epoxide ring to rearrange and form a phenol. Instead, the diol epoxide intercalates in the DNA and is covalently bound, covalently bound by 2 prime deoxy guanosine nucleoside, leading to the point mutation in the course of DNA replication. Okay. Um, all right, so now this is the figure two. So we have read the passage, okay? Let's solve the problem. Let's get to solving of the problems. Um, and a lot of these problems are not necessarily going to um, test you based on what you understood from the problem because this is organic chemistry, right? This is not English test. This is not an English test. So now determine the absolute configuration of carbon seven and carbon eight, right? They're trying to figure out, do you understand, can you, um, understand the chemistry. Uh, can you figure out RNS for those carbons uh, as shown in figure two, okay? So this is the figure two and carbon seven and eight, the one which is, it says, um, the wh what did it say? It says for the diol epoxide, right? So we're not obviously talking about the first structure, but the one at the bottom, because obviously uh, the one up top does not even have a chiral center, correct? only the one at the bottom, okay? So now for carbon seven, we can retrace from the structure above that carbon seven is this carbon and this other carbon is carbon eight, okay? Mm -hmm. So now on carbon seven, we want to determine whether this is, mm -hmm. uh, this is R or S, right? Absolute configurations. So now let's start to number these atoms and remember the numbering of these atoms. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do for one, uh, I'll explain it, but for the other one, um, well, maybe I should do for both. Okay, so let's go for a carbon seven. So this is the first oxygen atom attached to carbon seven. Oxygen has the highest 
molecular mass. That's why it gets the highest priority, right? And then um, this is a carbon and on the left is also a carbon. On the right is also a carbon. We are numbering the attachments of carbon seven. So now on the left, what we have is a carbon which is connected to the oxygen. And on the right, you have a carbon which is connected to um, a double bond and a single bond, which is equivalent to connection to three uh, carbons, right? Because a ca connection to double bond C, double bond C is equivalent to a connection to two equivalent, uh, two equivalent single bond Cs, right? Uh, okay, and now, Again, on the left, the carbon is connected to oxygen, which has a higher molecular mass. Always oxygen has a higher molecular mass. That's why this one gets the highest priority. And the one on the third is on the right. So now if we join one to two to three, if we connect the atoms from one to two to three, right? What do we see? What do we see here? We see we are going anti, we're going clockwise here. So this is a clockwise direction. But however, the fourth priority is hydrogen, which is above the plane. And th these normal rules follow when the hydrogen is below the plane or the lowest priority is below the plane, but it's not. And that's why the rules reverse and we use a uh, use the inverted rule for uh, this, um, for, for this. So the criteria in, uh, reverses itself, right? So we use uh, the inverted rule, which says that if you're going uh, clockwise, then that carbon atom would be S. And if you're going anti, that becomes R. These rules reverse themselves when the lowest priority is not below the plane or is not facing down, okay? Okay, now let's go to carbon eight, which is C8 and in carbon C8, I'm going to erase all of this. So what I see in carbon eight, if I prioritize these groups, so oxygen again is a higher molecular mass, gets the number one. And now if I go on the right, what I see is that carbon is attached to an oxygen and on the left, the carbon is also attached to the oxygen. So then we cannot find the point of difference because on both these positions, we essentially, have the same molecular mass, right? So we cannot tell which one is going to get the priority. This is C8. Okay, so then we move over one more carbon. So let's go to the third carbon, third point of attachment. And we do go to the third point of attachment. What we see again here is that at the third point of attachment, this carbon is again connected to uh, three equivalent single bonded carbons, right? They're all, there is one double bond, which is equivalent to two single bonded carbons, and there's one single bond. But again, when you go to the third attachment on the left, what we see here is there is an oxygen attachment on the third carbon on the left. And now whenever we see an oxygen attachment, that's a higher molecular mass, and that's going to win over a lower molecular mass, which is carbon. So now the, the attachment on the left then actually gets a higher molecular mass of so that is priority two, right? And then obviously then on the third, uh, the third would be the attachment on the right. And then what we do see here is the hydrogen is pointing below the plane and below the plane is uh, priority four, right? And now if we do connect our atoms and go from one to two to three, so what we see here, if we're moving clockwise, and if you are moving clockwise, that becomes R, right? And now again, it's important to note here that the hydrogen is pointing below the planes. So the least priority is pointing below the planes. So we are using common rules. So we're using the general rules and the rules are not reversed in this case. So clockwise is R and anti is S, right? So for, uh, C8, now we're going clockwise and the rules are normal. So this is R, right? So now let's look at the options. And in the options, what we see is 7S and 8R is option D. So option D is the answer for the first problem. Okay, uh, let's read the second problem, which says that all of the following statements about the diol epoxide shown in figure two are correct except 
right? The first option is the epoxide bears the same type of leaving group as an ether, right? So is that correct or not? So let's think about it. Epoxide is ROR and ether is OR. So essentially, they are the same leaving group, right? Um, second option is the ring strain and torsional strain increases the free energy of the epoxide. So again, um, we do know that if you have an epoxide, especially a three-membered uh, epoxide, so it does have a high reactivity because of the ring strain. So, well, obviously, if you are uh, straining your molecule, not, not even just an epoxide, right? If you do have um, a ring strain, it does increase the energy. And so we do know that it increases the reactivity. They want to react faster. And that's because their energies are higher, they're less stable. So it does increase the free energy of the epoxide. That is true as well, right? Uh, and then option C, epoxide may react under strongly acidic conditions. So which is also very, very true because as soon as you add the acid H plus on the epoxide, the lone pair of oxygens, going to attack that hydrogen, it's going to get activated, right? And that is one of the ways to actually activate an epoxide. If it's specifically three-membered, it does not even require acidic activation because itself is so activated. So it does, yeah, for sure, that is correct as well. Uh, and the next option is the epoxide oxygen atom is capable of donating a hydrogen bond, right? Now, the question is, is that correct? So the oxygen does have a lone pair of electrons and it does donate the lone pair of electrons, but does it donate a hydrogen bond, right? It's a very kind of just a tricky question. It's almost like they're getting you uh, by playing tricks on you. So they're capable of donating hydrogen bond. Is that true? It does not donate a hydrogen bond. It accepts a hydrogen bond because it donates electrons, right? So that's kind of a little bit tricky. So you have to be careful to not get into like traps like these. I know MCAT has set up like similar traps where they're going to get to you, not, not on technicality, right? If you do, if you're really good with technicality, you still have to be very careful of what the problem is actually testing you on, right? Uh, okay, uh, let's get to, so then part D is actually um, the right answer uh, for the second problem. Uh, okay, let's get to problem three, which is rank the following four substances in order of increasing reactivity with arene oxide. Okay, and now, well, uh, if we go back to uh, this problem here, right, and they uh, they tell us what an arene oxide is, so you don't really have to guess it here. So arene oxide, don't um, get confused. It's It doesn't necessarily have to be a full arene, right? An arene oxide has a, a, a epoxide on the two carbons where you're expecting the double bond to be. Okay, so this is an arene oxide. So you would think that, oh, if it's an arene oxide, how is it going to be, uh, how is it even going to react? Okay, so now we know the structure from the passage itself. So now the question is, rank the following four substances. Again, they're testing you on, do you understand the reactivity of arene oxide? Do you understand that arene oxides are going to react with nucleophiles, right? And not electrophiles, unless we use an acid to activate them. So then uh, they're not essentially telling us that we are looking at the reactivity of nucleophilic or nucleophilicity, meaning that we are trying to find which one is a better nucleophile uh, compared to the rest of uh, the nucleophiles. But again, the, the motive here is to, uh, I guess, test you on two things. The first is, do you understand that we're Which looking at is the nucleophilicity better and, than uh, nucleophile. Okay. All right. So then in this problem, right, uh, the first option is OH minus. The second option is ammonia. Third option is methide, which is CH3 minus. Fourth option is water. Okay. So out of, in, out of uh, these four options, what, what do we see? The difference in between these four options is that the first option and the third option, they're negatively charged, right? And the second option and the fourth option is neutral. Uh, so from the rules of nucleophilicity, what we know is that the first option and the third option, the negatively charged nucleophiles are stronger compared to the, the neutral nucleophiles, right? 
So uh, then um, now we want to figure out R of OH minus and CH3 minus, we have narrowed it down to OH minus and CH3 minus. So the question is out of these two nucleophiles, which one is a better nucleophile, okay? So uh, amongst OH minus and CH3 minus, right? So um, let's think about if OH minus is a better nucleophile or not. Uh, the difference, again, every time we come to a point of similarity, we try to figure out the point of difference, right? So the point of similarity is they both are nucleophiles, but what is the point of difference here? The point of difference is atoms, right? The atoms are different. One is oxygen, the other is carbon. Oxygen is more like negative than carbon. So that oxygen would want to hold the negative charge closer to itself, right? And the carbon would try to not hold the negative charge as close to itself so that negative charge can actually attack on the epoxide. Uh, it would be more reactive. It would, wouldn't have a hesitation to use the lone pair of electrons or the negative charge to attack as much as OH minus because OH minus can stabilize the negative charge better because it's electronegative. It, it has a stronger grasp of those electrons towards itself, right? And that's why let's now let's look at the options. OH minus is, uh, oh wait, CH3 minus is option three, right? So methide is option three. And what we see is, uh, that there are two options where, where it says that option three is actually um, CH3 and CH3 is actually B, uh, is the most reactive for option B and option D, okay? And at this point, well, we are trying to also speed up the process of solving problems. So at this point, now let's see out of option B and D, what is the least reactive? And then we use our logic to kind of eliminate which one is the least reactive. And if that matches with whichever option, then we choose that option. So out of B and D, so option for um, option B says the four, option four is the least reactive, which is water. And option D says that uh, ammonia is the least reactive, which is NH3, right? Now out of ammonia and water, we, we understand that uh, they both have they both have lone pair of electrons that they're going to attack with and not the negative charge. So then, yeah, they are less reactive. But then again, the point of difference is that one is nitrogen and the other is oxygen, right? Now, um, nitrogen is less electronegative compared to water. And that's why nitrogen would be um, more, nitrogen would be readier. Or it would want to donate the electrons more easily compared to that of the water, right? And um, water would again hold those lone pairs closer to itself because it is more electronegative. And now, uh, again, ammonia would react faster, right? And water would be uh, uh, the worst amongst all of these options. Water would be the worst nucleophile. So we get fourth option as um, the option with the least nucleophilicity. So then option B is the correct answer, right? So then for question three, option B is the correct answer. All right, now let's look at uh, problem four for this passage problem. Which labeled atom of the nucleoside shown below is responsible for intercalation of the dial epoxide? Okay, at this point, I don't understand biology, right? So when, when I don't, well, you guys probably understand it better, but I don't. Which labeled atom of the nucleoside shown below is responsible for intercalation of the diol epoxide? So at this point, what I would do uh, is I'm going to go back to the problem and I'm going to say, I'm going to see where do they talk about intercalation? I have actually highlighted the problem, right? So the danger of 7,8 diol epoxide lies in the unwillingness of the epoxide ring to rearrange and form a phenol. Instead, the diol epoxide intercalates in the DNA, which just means that um, the diol epoxide right over there, we do know that it does react with nucleophile. We have understood that from problem three, and uh, we are thinking about which one is going to be a better nucleophile, right? Again, it 
if in this sugar moiety, see, I know what a sugar molecule is. So in this sugar molecule, right? So the question is which, where in the DNA would be the atom that would actually attack on the epoxide present on the sugar moiety, basically, right? So now we want to think about the nucleophilicity of atom four, atom three, and atom two, which all of them are actually nitrogen. So now we're trying to think about which one of these is actually a better nucleophilic nitrogen. Again, now let's think about point of differences of all of these nitrogen. Atom four is sp2 nitrogen. Atom two is, you would think this is sp3 and, sec uh, SP3 and secondary, right? But it's not because uh, the lone pairs are busy with resonance and sp3 nitrogen on atom 3 is actually the um, most available uh, nitrogens. Uh, again, you would think that carbon, you would think that the um, the, the nitrogen, right, uh, which is primary, which we think is primary here, is also in conjugation uh, with the pyridine ring, right? But this resonance is not going to be, uh, yeah, this resonance is not so favored. It, it's, it's not going to allow that resonance uh, because uh, the atom 2's resonance is kind of very important. It's kind of helping to develop the aromaticity in this ring, right? However, uh, if you bring in electrons from this lone pair, it's it's actually taking away the aromaticity, right? So uh, it's uh, the donation into that ring is not going to be so favored from atom 3 or nitrogen. And that's why th those lone pairs are more readily available for donation. And that's why atom 3 is uh, more most nucleophilic and the answer to that problem. Okay. Uh, question five, which of the following arene oxide will react as in figure one to form the most stable carbocation intermediate? Let's go back to figure one, right? And when we see the figure one, what we see is that the carbocation is per formed in the first step. And when the carbocation is formed in the first step here, right, what we see is it's a ring opening by uh, an acidic proton. Um, so um, once the carbocation is formed, it's going to be formed at this position. We just need to think about which of these carbocation is actually the most, which of these carbocation is actually the most stable, right? Um, again, what we know from uh, the intermediate, um, stability of intermediate and mechanistic um, studies or from the mechanism point of view for uh, all of these reactions is that uh, a carbocation is stable is stabilized by electron donating groups, right? And what we see here uh, for option A, we have electron donating group, okay? And then option B is actually electron withdrawing group. Option D is weakly donating, right? And option C is just hydrogen has basically nothing. So then, well, obviously electron donating group will stabilize a carbocation the most, and that's why it will form the most stable carbocation intermediate. So we get option A for problem five as the answer. That's it for now. We solved uh, five problems in a one passage problem. And so I will see you next time in the second problem where we go over another set of five problems, most likely, um, and learn to, to map and navigate the passage problems that we see on the MCAT series. And until then, take care and I will see you guys next time.